five days, four days, something like that. Batman is coming, Andrew Fantasia. Thanks for joining me on Digital Charcuterie. What up? Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, we're. I keep forgetting how close we are to oh, this movie. Coming I know. Out. It feels to me like it's it's been two months away for a year. This movie, they started it before the pandemic. Then they got stuck in the pandemic. And then cast and crew members, I believe, uh, caught COVID. And that, that created like a, a stalled moment. So it was supposed to come out in like 2021, I think, April 2021. And then June 2021. And then October 2021. And here we are. 2022 February just a few short days away from the Batman coming out releasing hitting us finally in the groin it's just gonna sucker punch us with the bat nips I can't wait I'm really excited I I I always say this all the time and everybody hates me Andrew but I there has never been a Spider-Man movie and there's never been a Batman movie that I have not enjoyed and I do not care what anyone says about Batman and Robin I will fight you on that until the day I die which might be soon because of my love for that movie. It's a terrible movie. I I I'm, I, I never defend it against people who hate it. <laughs> I just I just I well, I just watched it uh, two weekends ago. When was the last time you saw Batman and Robin? Ooh. <laughs> the, the last time <laughs> you, know, you were seven. <laughs> it's it's funny because I was just uh, I was rewatching the Nolan movies last week because I haven't seen those since 2012, which is crazy. Um, but you the, haven't uh, seen them in a decade. Yeah, like wow. I, I haven't seen them since the Dark Knight Rises came out, and I'm just like I'm I'm watching it again, and I'm hearing Bane talk, and I'm thinking like that was around the time I started working at Starbucks when that movie wow. came out, because wow. I remember my my manager, uh, he was like, oh, you're you're in because it was inside a grocery store, this Starbucks, and the manager was like, oh, you're you're an actor, so you must be good at like you know talking to people. He's like, do you want to? be the guy who makes those announcements in the grocery store, like, hi, shoppers, there's a sale in produce. And I was like, okay, fine. And then he kept making me do it and I was getting annoyed. And the movie had just come out. So just as like for shits and giggles one day, I did this whole announcement in Bane's voice. And I was like, customers, there's a tomato, sir. <laughs> and I'm sitting eating my lunch later and the manager walks up to me with this look on his face and I'm like, oh shit, I'm in trouble. And he says, Andrew, that was you on the announcements wasn't it? And I'm like, yes. And he looks at me, he goes, I had a bit of trouble hearing you. Next time, just speak a little more clearly. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> him, him and the entire audience in the, uh, the screening was in front of Mission Impossible. All have, I can't believe it's been a decade since you saw those movies. I just watched The Dark Knight recently. Those were the movies that when they came out, I was I loved Batman Begins, and I, mean, I loved The Dark Knight, and then I loved Rises. And I would always tell myself, this one's my favorite. And then I would watch them and the next one I watch would be like, oh, no, this one's actually my favorite. Then I'd watch, no, this one's actually my favorite. And then you keep going, no, actually. And I just, I think they all work really well together. I know Rises is one that, I always thought it was strange, and this is obviously goes with my taste of movies because this is how I am always, but I always thought it was strange that people were underwhelmed by that one in a lot of respects. And look, in that movie, though, that movie had to go through a lot of changes because obviously the Joker was meant to be a part of that of that final film. So they had to make some changes and adjustments there. But I thought it worked out perfectly. I thought it was a fitting end to the to the uh, trilogy that Nolan gave us. And then, of course, that gave us Man of Steel, which then gave us the Batfleck, which can't complain about Batfleck. He's, he might be Andrew going into – answer your phone from 1981, please. Your rotary phone. <laughs> it's just nothing but telemarketers. <laughs> All day. I know. This is the fourth telemarketer since 10 o'clock. Answer it and hit the number two, and it'll take you to somebody on the line if it's automated. Always oh, hit, uh, hit two, it takes you, and they're never happy to hear you. <laughs> um, but let's get into the Batman. The early reviews are in, Andrew. We had actually last um, last week, or this weekend, I think it was, somebody who has been watching this channel and the Rebel Scum channel for quite some time emailed me saying that they had a chance to watch the Batman uh, at a screening that they had in LA. It was you, yes. Uh, they sent an email. There was no spoilers in the email because this person does know that I am someone who hates spoilers with a passion. Doing shows like this, though, sometimes you have to dive into those spoilers. Um, I prefer theories to spoilers and, and speculation, but sometimes when you do these, Andrew, you have to get into the spoiler stuff. But we're not going to spoil anything today. Uh, this person did not give me any spoilers because of what I just said. 
They did like it very, very much, though, Andrew. Uh, they, they did say a few things that are going to come up that we're going to talk about in a second with these early reactions to it. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what I said to the guys on Super Tuesday. This person ended the email by saying, <clears throat> and the Joker, ha, ha, ha. And uh, I, was, I was like, what does that mean? No, no, that was it. That's how the email ended. The joke, and the Joker, ha, ha, ha. And, and then the sign off, and that was it. And I was like, oh, well played, well played, well played. But let's go right into these uh, early words, Andrew. This is kind of, I got this, um, I, these are everywhere right now, but I think I got these off of Screen Rant, so credit to them for it. Uh, but here we go. Hannah Flint from MTV New, uh, Movies says, Matt Reeves delivers a nail-biting and fun Batman coming-of-age story. Absolutely euphoric, says Unilad. Total Film says, calls it sensational. I like that these are all just the words that are going to go on like that trailer that comes out right after yeah. it debuts, right? Or the night before. Uh, Empire says, gripping. Uh, Shortlist says, one hell of a movie. And Insider says, Robert Pattinson will be your new favorite Batman. Andrew, let's, I mean, there's not really much to say about it other than everything is glowing. This film is glowing from top to bottom. Does that make you excited to see it? Or are you a little bit hesitant walking into Matt Reeves, the Batman? I wish more critics would use the word orgasmic when they're describing films. Um, this, I don't think there's any hesitancy right now. I mean, is this going to be as good as Batman and Robin? Probably not. But we can't go in with those expectations. Uh, by the way, to answer your question, I have not seen any of the four original Batman movies since high school. So that's that's my bad. That is my bad. I'm sorry. Though I have gotten, as you know, I have gotten my voiceover students to dub over a scene from yes. Batman and Robin, which they loved doing. I would uh, highly recommend going back to those movies and watching them sooner than later. Oh, for sure. If for nothing else than the fact that they're the only ones that have gotten in my opinion, Gotham City, right. Uh, particularly the Schumacher stuff for how otherworldly it is. Uh, these things, the, these these critic uh, uh, phrases that they're dropping, this is all what I expected to hear, James. I, I don't think I was expecting, even though we live in an age where divisiveness seems to come hand in hand with giant movies like this, um, I mean, we saw it with Ghostbusters. We saw it with like every big movie of the last really five years. But with this one, I, I really was not expecting that kind of divisiveness. I really just thought that this was going to be another universally beloved film that everybody would love for like right now. And then, you know, five years from now, you get those stupid friggin', uh, you know, clickbait articles five reasons why the batman is not as yes. bad as we remember it um god those things are garbage but i i, I just feel <laughs> like that's that's the road we're headed on is wonderful across the board until somebody needs to do a, a clickbait article the the uh, embargo for this movie lifts at 9 a.m. on Monday so andrew just stay away from social media as of 9 a.m. on monday if you don't want to be spoiled because you know that Forbes, the headline will be like, why am I red You know, <laughs> something crazy like that. That'll be their headline. Like, like, the Joker's key role in the Batman. Like, that'll be oh, Forbes' headline. That's how they roll over there. But the embargo lifts at 9 a.m. Eastern time. I think it was Eastern time on Monday. That leaves us uh, a day because I think a, a couple countries are getting it on the Tuesday. And then the fan event is on the Wednesday. And then sad sacks like us are going to go see on a Thursday. <laughs> that's, how we, that's how we roll. So all next week is going to be all very Batman centric on everything. But like I said, these don't stick out to me that much because they feel like this is what they'll be using to promote the movie as we get closer to it. These are, you know, the verbiages, the little one words, like I'll bring it back up on the screen here. When you get gripping and sensational. You could just picture that with with Batman swooping through the sky, right, and that big like three D font coming at you or something like that. That's all these say. They don't say anything to really tell you what's going on other than the nail biting and fun Batman coming of age story, which again is something that Matt Reeves said at DC Fandom. There's nothing new in these, and because it feels like this is what they are doing, that this is for 
the the trailer for the commercials, the TV spots, and for the posters and whatnot. That's probably why we haven't seen anything negative because they're probably out there. But I, I'll bet you uh, Warner Brothers is like, is, you know, they've got their nose on this. And like, you're going to say this, you can, you're allowed to release that, and they're kind of letting people do that. And anybody that d- jumps the gun, guess what? When Batman Two comes out, you're not welcome to see it early mm-hmm. anymore. Right? That's how that's how it's going to be. You, that's how it is, and that's how I feel about these. But I, I wanted to bring up one thing with you because obviously it's very positive. I feel like it is going to get a very high critic score. The Batman, Matt Reeves is, I mean, he's a very confident director. We've seen that in play, unless he really screws up on this one, which I don't, I mean, everything we've seen, I don't, I, I don't see that happening. But at the same time, I haven't seen it all together, so I don't know. But we, we like just two weeks ago, Unchar- or a week ago, Uncharted came out. And it, on Rotten Tomatoes, which I hate Rotten Tomatoes. I don't even like discussing it, but it's a thing and it's in society and this is what people use to determine whether or not they're going to watch a movie because most people can't use their own brains anymore. But it had like 39% critic approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, which is still four out of 10 people like it, but whatever. 39% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes. The critical rating was something like 91 or 92%. Is, this is a, Uncharted you're talking about? Uncharted. Have you seen Uncharted? No. No, I don't want to. <laughs> but but that's it. But fans, people who are going to the movie are leaving it and are, are loving this movie. Mm-hmm. If you go by and, and I'm just going by this rating. I haven't seen any of it. But this is the rate, this is how it is. 39% one way, 92 the other. But then a movie like The Last Jedi is like 92% critics and like 40% audiences. So there's this weird divide. Do you think, Andrew, that because my thing with critics nowadays is that they're like they're giving like these spots to people like us who are just on YouTube or write a blog or whatever. They're not people who actually a lot a lot of them do, but there's a lot of people who don't even really appreciate film. They just they have their mind set before they even watch a movie, right? Like we talk about all the time, like things leak and then based on or like a producer or director will come in and be like, we went for this, like like the Batman, for instance. Matt Reeves is like, it's Chinatown, it's Seven, it's Zodiac. And everybody's like, oh, it's like Zodiac and it's like Seven. I'm like, yeah, but that's what he said. And I always bring this up with Spider-Man Homecoming when they kept saying that Spider-Man Homecoming was like a John Hughes film. And then I watched it. I was like, that was not like a John Hughes movie. And then everyone was like, it's like a John Hughes movie. I'm like, but it's not really like a John Hughes movie. The mm-hmm. second one is more of a John Hughes movie than the first one. Yeah. But but it's like, it's in your head. And I think that that really, that kind of has been coming out on people a lot. like in the critical responses we see that so they have they have a mindset going into a movie and then we see that play out in their critical response but audiences on the grand scheme they don't really pay attention to that stuff in the mass market do you think that there's a chance of that happening with the batman or is it just the greatest film of all time yes and yes (laughs) Um, (laughs) it's all around yes i think it's going to it's I don't think there's going to be that kind of uncharted level of divisiveness or Last Jedi. Definitely not a Last Jedi level of divisiveness. I I feel like oh, if let's there's hope not. Yeah, I feel like if there's any division that's going to happen, it's going to actually be a political kind of division. And forgive me for getting political for a minute, but what I feel is going to happen is uh, and I I hope this isn't just coming from a place of bias because I'm excited for the Riddler. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking like, yeah, see, I told you all the Riddler is, is, is money in the bank. Why did you not listen to me? But it, from the sounds of things, it feels like the Riddler's MO in this film is something that is kind of in the air politically right now in the world, mm-hmm. which is rich people kind of suck. Uh, and it looks like he's targeting the billionaires of Gotham or whatever, or the elites, the 1% of Gotham to make that point. And I feel like that is going to be something that people who watch this film take away from it. And if it's going to create any kind of division, it's going to sort of stoke that fire. And I feel like the people who will watch this movie and say, this is garbage, are those 1% people because they're the victims in the film. Uh, so I, I feel like we're going to see a bit of that. I feel like this is going to be one of the, because it feels like it's, it's coming out at a time where it's saying something about the world. And I don't think we've had many superhero movies do that to my knowledge. 
So I feel like that is going to be fueling the fire of people who love it and also fueling the fire of people who don't. But I think that the side that loves it is going to be a much bigger side because it's called the 1% for a reason. Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. I, I totally agree. I do think, though, there's going to be – It's I, I think you and I are going to enjoy this movie. I mean, I'm going to. It's Batman. Batman and Spider-Man have free passes. Andrew. This is just how it works. Batman's been sort of Star Wars, I guess. But I, they just have free passes. Like, oh, yeah. I just enjoy it, and I leave, and then that's it. It's three hours, though. And and The Dark Knight, which is heralded as, what, the best Batman movie, sometimes even the best comic book movie. Although comic book movies are weird now because there's, like, comic comic book movies, which is the MCU, and then there's, like, The Dark Knight, which they're, they're so very different. They're not even... They're only the same genre because of the source material. They're, they're not at all. Like, you, you could not compare Endgame to The Dark Knight. You, no. Whatever you... Well, you, could, you could try. You're not going to win because it's just... They're very different. But I know people who watch the movie and they're like, it's too long. It's boring. It's slow. I, and I feel... And, and the concern... It's not a concern. But when you think about this Batman movie, I don't know if it's going to be slow. But we talk about Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, and that movie's like two hours and fifteen minutes. This is forty-five minutes longer. This is this is this is a this is a an episodic television show <laughs> drama longer than than. And I know you love long movies. We don't need to get into that. But the, but I the one drawback that I can see with audiences is that they might feel it's too long. Uh, I know that people are saying there's a lot of humor in the email. I did get it to say that Penguin um, did generate a few more laughs than they expected. They really enjoyed the Penguin. I'm only saying that because I love the Penguin. It's not ruining anything. I mean, the Penguin's great, so it's whatever. Um, but it just it, it is three hours. It is more serious in tone than Endgame, which was also three hours. So if we are going to compare them, we compare let's compare the t running time of those two movies. And I just spoke to our friend Rob today, and he's like, it's kind of weird that the first Batman is three hours. And I said, well, why? Like, I mean, if you're if it is being compared to like Zodiac and Seven One, Zodiac I think is around three hours long. If you're gonna tell like this mystery and solve it, I and I, I you know I'm not into the longer movies, Andrew. But if if it's a mystery and it needs the time to unfold, give it the time to unfold. That's how I feel. Like Lord of the Rings needs the time to unfold. I'm okay with that movie being that long as well. Titanic could have been a half hour shorter, and Avatar could have been two hours shorter. But that's not the point. <laughs> the point is the Batman. Do you think the length is going to hinder audience, like the general public's reaction to this? Do you think that that's going to maybe drop its, uh, let's just call it the audience score for the sake of calling it the audience score, but is it going to detract from from repeat viewings? And I know that you don't believe in the repeat viewings. And we're not, that's not what I mean, but I just mean like if people find it, nah, they like it, but nah, is that going to hinder people returning to the theater? Well, I mean, if people find a movie, nah, it's going to hinder them whether that movie's three hours or 80 minutes. I don't know, because uh, here's the argument, though, is like we see it with Star Wars, and I think the MCU is the same, where people are like, it was okay, and then they go back seven times. <laughs> yeah. Well, those people are just nuts. I can't speak for that. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think that the... Uh, I don't think the runtime is going to affect it negatively in any way. Uh, like, it's just... The numbers don't lie. The highest grossing movies of all time are long ass movies and it has nothing to do with the length. It just has to do that. They also wow. happen to be great movies. Uh, you're going to see, I think you're going to see some people um, like a, like a small minority of people who are just like, my bladder can't handle that. I'm yeah. just going to wait for streaming. Fine. You know? Um, but I, I don't see a world where that's going to stand in its way. And I mean, you, Endgame doesn't feel like three hours. Uh, Dark Knight Rises, which I've just rewatched for the first time in a decade, it's my favorite Batman movie right now. It's like 243 or something. That's a long one too. Does not feel that long. When it's over, I'm like, again, again. It's, you know, it's all about what the content is. It's the Einstein's theory of relativity. You, you sit on a hot coal, a second feels like an hour. You sit with a hot woman, an hour feels like a second. That's relativity. So when we get to the point where the credits come and the lights come up on the Batman, we might be sitting there thinking, we've already been here for three hours. Like, I feel like we're just getting started. But Rob, you said it was Rob. He brings up a good point. Like, it's weird that typically the first movie in a planned franchise, at least nowadays, like in the new millennium, 
usually the things sequels get longer they get bigger so to start off with one that's three hours it just kind of makes me think like whoa what's that going to mean for the future and i know they're not really chugging ahead at warp speed with a second one uh like matt reeves has ideas but it's not like he sat down and he's like here's a trilogy here's how it's going to be so i don't know we might wait six years to see that movie who knows but it is weird to start off a franchise on a long movie. That is unprecedented. And this was my argument against that, though. It's like, okay, fine, maybe for this. But also, Avatar is three hours long, right? The, the Lord of the Rings was three hours long, the first mm-hmm. Fellowship of the So I, I suppose, but also if you are... And then I also mentioned the Zodiac thing. Like, if you're establishing all of this and, you've got to, and you have this plot and these, and these uh, mystery to unfold you've got to tell him you're going to have to take your time getting there. And, and look, he's got Catwoman, he's got Penguin, he's got Falcone, he's got Riddler, Joker, Two-Face, Mr. Freeze, and Louis the Lilac are all in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? But maybe Matt Hatter. There's like there's a lot going on, a lot of characters going on. And, and I don't think that that hinders anything. But if a character shows up, whether their name is Matt Hatter or their name is, is Troy, it doesn't matter. It's still a character, and that character needs some something to happen with them, like some kind of interaction, which takes time. Um, and, you know, there's a lot going on. It, it, it To your point about the, um, the the rich people earlier, yeah, it looks like it's there. I don't, have you seen the most recent? There's a clip that just came out with Falcone and Wayne at the mayor's funeral. Have you seen that, that clip? No, I don't like watching clips. I neither do I, but I but doing this channel, I have to. So I watched it, oh. and it was, uh, it is, yeah. There's a lot going on. I also, I would recommend Andrew if you can get your hands on it. I don't know if I would recommend paying the ten dollars for it. I did, but the prequel novel is worth a re, it's worth a glance. It's worth just like reading, picking it up. Oh, cool, and then putting it down because you learn a lot of the backstories and that. Like the Riddler was in it. The Riddler was actually in it a lot more than I thought. The Riddler was in it. He's not the Riddler at this point. He's Edward Nashton, but you find his connection with with the Waynes in this uh, book. It's very, it's very simple thing. And like, and you kind of find he does, he commits a crime in it. It's not, he's not the Riddler yet, but he commits the the crime, committing the crime is what uh, makes him decide to become the Riddler is because of what happened with, because of the outcome of this crime. He's like, well, I did it, but nobody cares. Like it's just, I just did it. And and so he decides, he's like, okay, I'm going to start to get people with riddles. But anyway, he, he commits a crime, but in that crime, he doesn't, his goal is not to, because in this, he's, he, it's like a murder mystery at times, right? He obviously he kills the mayor and stuff like that. But in this novel, he, he does, he commits, well, he, I'll just say he commits arson and he has the chance to kill probably hundreds of people. But instead, he makes sure they're out of the building before he burns it down. And he doesn't, he doesn't want them dead. And that really that got me because that that adds, I think, a dimension to this. I mean, I mean, obviously, this is this takes place years, probably a few years before this movie, but that's a, that's a dimension to this character that I wasn't, I didn't know. Like, okay, there's there is a purpose for it, and I I think that him and Batman are on the same trajectory in this film. They both they they're both working towards the same goal, but they they're on very opposite sides of the spectrum of how they go about it. Yeah, in the same way that both in universe and in the real world, you had a lot of people kind of saying, oh, Thanos was an asshole, but if you look at what he's doing, he's kind of got a good point. I feel like you're going to get the same thing with Riddler. Uh, Both in the real world and in Gotham, there's going to be people who are like, I'm frightened by this maniac, but at the same time, I totally appreciate what he's trying to do. And I think that's going to create a lot of interesting discussion once people have seen the movie. Do you think do you do you worry that it's gonna be all like cerebral and then the last act is just gonna be Batman and Riddler fighting each other mano a mano? No, I don't think so because like even like, like the the Dark Knight was smart enough to reel that in like even to the point where I think Heath Ledger had that dialogue where he says like Do you think I would base my whole plan on just a fist fight with you like I'm I'm not that stupid. I think that they'll go kind of the same route. It's not about Batman's got to get to him and punch his lights out because that the way the Riddler works is, yeah, you punch his lights out and you throw him in prison, but 
the thing he's been doing is still happening and whatever bomb he's at is still going off, you know? So it, it would it would be a huge detriment to the movie to end on just like, I beat you up, therefore I won, movie over. I think Matt Reeves is hopefully smarter than that. I hope we're not in for something like that. I wonder if the Riddler wins at the end. That's a great point too. Uh, I mean, you said something earlier about something that the critics said, I think, that made it feel like he does win at the end. Um, whether it's, it, it might be just even the comparisons to Zodiac, right? They never caught the Zodiac killer. Um, so I and think, seven. And oh yeah, did John Doe get away in seven? I can't remember. No, he gets he gets what he wants at the end though. He gets what he wants, right? Yeah. So it could be a question of that too, and I think that that uh, that makes for a really interesting dynamic that you have not seen in a Batman thing. Again, you've, we've seen it with Thanos, but in Batman, we've never seen that. Like the closest is maybe Bane for a few mm -hmm. months until Bruce comes back, but we've never seen like, here's what happens when they get what they want. You know, I think that's my one gripe with whatever, my one with uh, Dark Knight Rises is I never, feels like Star Wars and I never am able to grasp how much time has gone by. It's just all of a sudden, like, it's been months. I'm like, whoa, what? I thought it was like a week. <laughs> that's my only thing is I, I don't comprehend time in these movies. It's just like, <laughs> I don't know what it is. I just can't. Uh, I can't comprehend them. I, I do love that movie a, a lot, though. Wrapping it up, we have got a few days to go. You've seen these early responses. You're going to ignore all social media on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday until you see this movie. What are your uh, expectations going into it, and your hopes and your dreams, Andrew? I just it's high time the Joker got his due. So I just really hope we get a lot of Joker in the movie. Um, I think we're going to I think this is the Joker's movie and the and the Riddler when he takes ooh, off another that mask one. Is, another one. <laughs> Sorry. I think on. when the, I think the Riddler's gonna take off his mask and, and it's gonna be revealed that he is the Joker underneath that mask. Obviously, that's what's gonna happen. Oh my god. And same with Penguin. Penguin's gonna take off his fat suit and mm. he's also the Joker, because there's three Jokers in this movie. And Robert Pattinson is going to remove the bat suit and be like, you know what? I, I've decided I'm going to it's, cause crime instead of fight it. And he's going to paint a big smile on his face. It's actually the Batman who laughs. That's what yeah. this movie is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do I want? What am I? I just want to, uh, I, this is just totally selfishness talking, but I want, I want the world to finally see the Riddler the way I see him. Uh, yeah. You, know. you mentioned Jigsaw to me years ago, well yeah. before this movie was a thing. Yeah. So I, I want them to finally appreciate that this is a good villain. And hopefully what this does is it kickstarts a trend where we give love and we give particularly this brand of Nolan-esque slash Matt Reeves kind of love to villains that deserve more time, to villains like Freeze, to villains like Poison Ivy. Where's she been? Uh, people like Ventriloquist, people like Mad Hatter, people who have not had been given the chance to get this treatment yet, because I promise you there are great stories to tell with those villains. And if Riddler can kind of be the one to pioneer that, then I'm all the more proud for it because I've been singing his praises since day one. Yeah. I don't know about Poison Ivy. She's a little different than what appears to be the Reeves grounded in reality verse. I'm curious to see how grounded in reality this is versus uh, the Dark Knight. Well, one, one other thing I want to add, though, because you mentioned Grounded Reality, and I totally forgot to mention it, is based on what we're seeing in the trailers, another thing I'm really, really hoping for, please, is that Gotham does not look like a real city, is that it looks comic booky and just the like unrealistically big and, and crazy and shiny the way it did in Burton. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the comedy movie Mystery Men with William H. Macy and Ben Stiller. I own it. Okay, good. The city they live in in Mystery Men is like outlandishly unrealistic, yeah. and I find that friggin' beautiful. So I want to see them take that approach with Gotham, too. I don't think you're going to get that. I think you're going to get a mixture of Chicago and Glasgow. And, uh, uh, Glas Glasgow? Glasgow? I think, I think it's just going to be a combination of those two. I'm s sorry, Andrew. I don't. I, I could be wrong, though. I haven't seen the movie, and nobody, like, none of these words that have been released have been said, like, Gotham's eccentric or anything. So who knows what's going to happen. Having in my hopes for this is just, I just want to watch a Batman movie because it's been too long. You know, he's teamed up, and I love the team-ups and stuff. It's always, it's been fun 
seeing him in the uh, you know the Snyderverse, um, and then before that the Christian Bale, Nolan stuff, and then obviously you know Clooney was the greatest Batman of them all. <laughs> and he says that he had a bat credit. Card. What other Batman had a bat credit card? Only Clooney. So if you're debating mm-hmm. that, you're you 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 lose because he's the only one that had a credit check. <laughs> like, oh, Batman, your credit score is great. Like, that's how he bought the. Oh, and the oh the 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 Bat Cave is explained in the uh, prequel novel as well. You kind of understand like how he gets the Bat Cave and, and why, and it's very simple explanation. Like very very simple explanation. There's not much there. It's great, and Alfred finds it, which is also awesome. Uh, and there's a lot there. I do recommend the book. It's a little. It's a very short read. It's like I don't know what is a hundred pages somewhere around there, and it's a young adult novel. And it would be the perfect one, Andrew, if you were in like elementary school and you were looking forward to this movie so much and you got this book to, before you saw the movie. Like this is that's what this book is. It's for uh. kids. And it's great. Yeah, but it's a fun little read with little tidbits that kind of lead you on, like, oh, this happens, that happens. And like the and it kind of sets the seeds of like what kind of a, a mob boss Falcone is, where Penguin is in his ranks, Maroni, things like that. And 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 so like for little details like that, if you are into Batman, I would recommend it. Andrew, I know you gotta go, but I do wanna wrap it up. We gotta talk about one more thing before we go though, and that is the Joker. Because I know you love the Joker. You just said earlier that you don't want to see the Joker in this movie at all because you hate all things Joker. You are you don't even watch Joaquin Phoenix movies anymore. You're totally on a boycott of all things. So you're like Road Trip was your favorite movie. Now you can't stand it because of the connection with the Joker. There are reports that that this is being based off of several Batman comics and storylines. Mm-hmm. And one of them could see um, it, the, the long Halloween was always one that they were referring to, right? It was a long Halloween. We saw the first clips or pictures we saw from this were on Halloween. It was, it was a kid in a Superman shirt and a Flash shirt, I believe. So Halloween plays a part in it. I have read reports that it begins on Halloween as well. Uh, and then That's in the cool. long Halloween, yeah, the long Halloween, there is a murderer who murders on holidays. I'm getting... and and Batman has to speak to somebody who acts kind of like a Hannibal Lecter in that story. The Joker in this film, do you think the Joker could be playing that part of the Hannibal Lecter type who is helping the Batman, not helping, but is kind of assisting the Batman in his search for the Riddler? You know what? If that's the case, I'm 100% down for that, man. Because that is a way of putting the Joker into the story that's not the same thing we've seen 45 times. Um, you know, it, it's, I don't want to see another story of the Joker's like, I've got a bomb. <laughs> I like, I don't care. Like, I want to see it's, that. It's done. It's done. <laughs> it's done. He has set off enough explosives. We are good. This is a way of giving all the Joker fans another Joker. Fine. But doing it in a way that's different and that's going to stand out and that nobody really expects um aside from you because you're the only person i've heard bring up this idea of the hannibal Lecter thing so i think that that's a beautiful way to do it that's how you take a character who is woefully overused and find a way to put him in and make it fresh that's how you do it so i say go for it could be a lot of fun it's also it's a way also where you have someone on the inside assisting but the but Batman clearly cannot trust what this person is saying whatsoever. Uh, so I really, really like it. I, I don't know if that's going to happen. I know, I think there will be someone on the inside that he does have to, that somebody gets some kind of assistance from, whether it's Joker or or not. I would love to see it be a character that we know, because this is supposedly like more of a, it's not Batman Begins, it's the Rogue Gallery Begins, and we're kind of seeing the mm-hmm. creation of the Riddler, we're seeing the creation of Catwoman, we're seeing Penguin become Penguin. Who else are we seeing um, become who they are about to become? And do the events, does the Riddler's action create some of these villains? Um, not firsthand, but because of that, it's kind of a snowball effect and creating other villains. And I think the Joker is just because he's so crazy and maniacal like he, he doesn't he doesn't think straight obviously and i think that's why people are drawn to him andrew because you can do whatever you want with the joker and his backstory could be whatever you want it to be there's no real joker backstory whereas everyone else there's kind of something and 
you know, you got to worry about their names and stuff. But the Joker could be Arthur Fleck. He could be uh, what's his, Jack Napier. He could be whatever. He could be nobody. He could be whatever you want him to be. And that's what people find so intriguing. And and if he's guiding, and, and the idea of the Joker guiding Batman is also one that I think would be iconic for the fans, right? Because everybody, the end of the Snyder cut of of the Justice League when they're together and they're, you're like, oh, that's awesome. You want up that and you're like, well, now I have to go to my most feared foe to help me fi- find my next most feared foe. What the hell is going on? This universe is crazy. Bring on a sequel. I will say also that email that I got, it did say that it ended with them wanting more, but the more is going to have to wait because we're going to wrap it up right now. Andrew's got a lot of editing to do and he's also uh, recording an Infinity Rewatch today that will go up sometime on this very channel and on wherever you listen to YouTube. So Andrew, why don't you punch, push that and also your own personal channel? That's right. Today we're doing a, a revisit of Spider-Man No Way Home. It's been a while. It's, it's, been- a, it's been a long time. Um, and we we had some comments um, from fans saying like, wow, there's so much that you didn't get to cover in the first episode. And we we were, I remember we were trying to be careful because uh, Ryan's wife was in the next room and we didn't want to spoil it for her. <laughs> so we were being quiet and it was just, it was not an ideal temperature to be like, oh my God, look what we just watched. So we're going to revisit it tonight. We're going to talk about it, even though I still have only seen it the one time because theaters in Canada have been a mess. So I'm just going purely off my memory of December 15th or whatever that was, but it's going to be fun. And then uh, you can also catch me on my YouTube channel, the Andrew Fantasia channel, uh, where there's video essays galore and all kinds of stuff. I just covered Scream 5 and what it means for metatextual storytelling. It's really fun stuff. I promise. You got to do a Batman retrospective on mm-hmm. Batman, and Robin. Batman and Robin only, though. Only Batman. Just Batman and Robin. Yeah. Hey, Batman minute by minute. Robin, Batman and Robin killed Batman for... Uh, several years and then it took blade and then x-men to kind of be like okay let's make spider-man like it it was a big blow and i saw it twice in the theater but that's all the time we have right now let us know your thoughts in the comments below what do you think of this batman movie are you gonna like it do you think you're gonna like it do you think it's for everybody do you think kids are gonna go see it because i don't think it's gonna make as much money as spider-man no way home but i don't think most movies for a while are gonna make as much money as spider-man no way home though if Doctor Strange starts leaking some cameos, it just might have a chance. But anyway, that's all we're going to say for now. We'll be back tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern, for Casual Friday. And until then, may you be the master of your own universe. I have the power. <laughs>